Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another weekly used gun review video for you. Remember in these videos we take about eight different used firearms that have come into the store, giving you a two to three minute review of each one to give you guys a general idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Remember the point of this video is not to sell you anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. It is strictly to be educational and entertainment. Anyway guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. Remember the format is we start with the most common and move through the least common as we progress through the video. So starting us off in the number one spot is a used Taurus 85 Ultralight. This is a 38 Special with a five round capacity. Now they made these in the full steel frame plus the Ultralight, uh, I'm sorry, Ultralight alloy frame. They make them in the stainless and the blue. The really good thing about this is the size and weight balance versus the price. So when it comes to Taurus products, a lot of people like to dig on their quality and their reputation for uh, being somewhat of a, what's a good word for it, economy or cheap uh, firearm. Actually, when it comes to the revolvers, I've always been a fan. They've always done very well by me. And in, in fact, the six years that we've been in business, I haven't had any type of uh, recall or any anything sent back to Taurus in the revolver arena, save for I had a Taurus Raging Bull where I believe the chambers were not reamed out enough. So the customer had uh, casings that were sticking after firing. Of course, not uh, anticipating for the case expansion or wasn't uh, wasn't finished off for the case expansion. So the casings would, would expand and then stick and you really couldn't get them out. You'd have to stick a rod and, and tap them out with a hammer really to get them out. But other than that, out of the probably hundreds of Taurus uh, 85s and their other line revolvers that we've sold since we've been open, uh, that's the only problem we've had. Now, brand new, the price point on something like this is about the 320 to 350 range. And under normal circumstances used, you should be able to find one of these in about the 189 to 250 range depending on condition if it's got a box or anything like that. They make a really good backup gun or if it's going to be your primary everyday concealed carry they are lightweight and the ultra light uh, uh, feel. They make a hammerless version or a bobbed hammer version I should say. It's similar to like the 442 air weight so they really do fit in that regard and if you're comparing it to something like a 442 at about half the price they make a really good option or if you want to use it as a backup a nightstand gun a camping gun something you can let get dirty a little bit rusty and not worry too much about the 85 series is great now you can get the full steel frame version uh, if you want to dampen down that recoil a little bit if you if you like that extra heft and weight to it i have relatively small hands my hand grip fits right at about to the base of of the grip so it's perfect size for me if you do have larger hands you might find the grip a little bit small but there is aftermarket support on stuff like this but anyway these are always really good sellers people are always looking to pick up a used 85 in any variety as long as it's priced right they never sit around too long so definitely something i recommend picking up and taking a look at so speaking of Smith & Wesson 442s or the Airweight series firearms, here is a Smith & Wesson 442. Now this one is a no dash with a nickel finish. So likely it was manufactured in the mid 1990s. It has a very short polymer grip on it. Again, now my pinky does fall off on this one. So the grip is a little bit smaller than that on the 85. It is a five round capacity with a gutter rear sight and a fixed front post. Now, of course, this is in the J frame family of firearms, which got its start in the 1950s with the Model 36, which you guys have seen on a previous video. Typically, you find these in a blued finish, but this is the early nickel. A lot of people talk about, you know, if you get a nickeled 442 from the 90s, that eventually the nickel finish does flake off on this. Uh, this one actually is in pristine condition. So the woman who brought this in was actually the original owner and she bought it in the mid 90s. So again, no dash, so there's a pre-lock, um, all those nice features that these Smith collectors like to have. Now, value on these, the 442 is still in manufacture and brand new, you're gonna get it at about the 420 to 490 $50 price point under normal circumstances. Used, we've typically had these at about the $300 price point, three to 350 respectively, depending on if it's got its box or anything like that. Now these being a nickel and being an early pre-lock and all that is going to have a little bit more value. Now there is no box with this. So I would suspect this in this condition, nickel, pre-lock, mid nineties, no dash. As somewhere around the $400 price point. The 442s and 642s were never really regarded as much of a classic collectible Smith, something like a Model 19 or a 27 or a, or a uh, 29 or anything like that. So there really is no huge collector value, but Smith collectors will want, you know, 
those advanced collectors who want to fill every single gap, this is the premium unupgradable one, the nickel with, with no lock, no dash. So for that, of course, you're going to get some collectability, but the pricing is not high enough to where it's going to price people out who want one as a viable defensive option. Really attractive looking firearm, nice lightweight being part of that airweight series, just a really all uh, overall classic uh, design and style revolver and would be a great addition to anybody's collection. Okay, up next I have the Zestava M70, which is also previously known as the CZ Model 70. Now this would be designed in 1970 as a scaled down compact version of the Yugoslavian M57, which is Yugoslavia's version of the TT-33 or Togarev pistols chambered in 762 by 25 Now one defining feature on that one was a slightly extended grip, which gave you one extra round in the magazine. That's how you know you're looking at a Yugo Tokarev M57 if you don't look at the markings. Okay, the M70, of course, being a scaled down variant of that was a single stack, uh, single action only hammer fire pistol chambered in 32 automatic. Of course, as I mentioned, you have a single stack magazine. Now, these were predominantly used by Yugoslavian police forces and some select, select uh, military usage, but of course, mainly as a police sidearm. Now, when these would fall out of service, they would of course come into the United States as surplus. Now, this is an older surplus M70, and the way that you can tell that is it does have its original military sights and no uh, altercations or alterations on the grip. Now, these are still coming in today. In fact, I have one of the current imports. Um, and this is the uh, a modern one that you can actually get right now on the market. Now the new ones are coming in with these really funky rear adjustable target sights and a glued on wedge which gives it sort of a target grip profile. That was to allow for import importation giving it a target or sporting purpose is my understanding. Of course what it's meant to happen when you get these is you're supposed to drift out those cheap plastic rear sights which are so funny because there's, look at the, the height on that. There's, if you sighted that, you'd be shooting like three feet over their head. Um, but you're supposed to tap that out, procure a site of, or a set of original sights, and then you could probably, this is just glued on, you could just knock it off with a screwdriver and a hammer. Uh, but that's essentially the same thing. So these nice older imports, of course, you don't have to mess with that. It also has a little bit more wear to it, but. From what I understand from people who have owned and shot these, there is no magazine disconnect. Uh, they are really fun little shooters and a good just concealable truck gun or camping gun or something like that you don't have to worry too much about. Very nice and bulky, sort of like a Polish P64 in the 9x18 uh, variety there. Now, price-wise on these, pretty typical. You're gonna find these around the $250 mark. These have been coming in for several years. They haven't really changed much in price, again, like the Polish P64, so. Um, People do like to snag these. They are unique and different, really nice balance and feel. And of course, not only for collectability, but also serve that purpose of being an inexpensive backup 32 automatic that you can just kind of throw around and not worry about. So for a 32, it's actually kind of heavy. Um, I would liken this to the size of maybe like a Glock 48, maybe somewhere in there. So this, something this size you could probably get today in a nine millimeter, actually sort of like a Ruger. It's got the similar lines of a Ruger LC9S. So for 32 automatic, big and heavy compared to other things on the market, but still really cool with that nostalgic sort of collectible, uh, collectability appeal there if you do like surplus firearms. Okay, up next is actually a personal favorite of mine. This is a CZ-75 specifically an SP-01 9mm. Now I've said in the past like the VP-9 was in my top five. This is probably also one in my top five. Not necessarily the SP-01, but the CZ-75 in general is one of my favorite 9mm handguns. Now, one interesting thing about the CZ-75 was it is sort of the flagship from the CZ handgun line, in my opinion, just like the SIG-226 would arguably be the same for the SIG line. It encompasses a, or has a frame that wraps around the slide. That's one really big defining feature, which gives you a very low bore access. You're gonna see the slide is very short, not a whole lot to grip onto, which is one negative, I guess. But it gives you very low muzzle flip and very low recoil. So quick, fo quick follow-up shots, really nice accuracy, especially if you like that low bore axis sight picture, uh, which I personally do. So the CZ-75 is a little bit of an interesting history. So if we're looking back into the late 1940s, early 1950s after World War II, of course you have the Iron Curtain and all that sort of stuff going on. Most of the Soviet pack countries were using surplus or lent uh, Soviet firearms, be they SKSs, uh, AK-47s, that sort of thing, AKMs. Now, Czechoslovakia is one of those countries to do, they sort of took inspiration from Soviet firearms, but really made their own with this uh, VZ uh, or CZ-52. 
uh, instead of using the SKS. And of course they had the proprietary round 760 by 45, if I'm not mistaken. They also had the uh, VZ58, which was similar to the AK, but of course functionally very different. Now, they did adopt the Soviet handgun cartridges, a 7.62x25 Tokarev and the 9x18 Makarov, and they did uh, issue and manufacture the CZ82 handguns, which were used by their military and police, even after the production of this. So this was really designed to be an export model. It was designed to fire the 9mm Parabellum, which was popular and, of course, a lot of Western countries at the time. Now, the funny thing is, is of course, this is being manufactured in Czechoslovakia and or Czech, current day Czech Republic and is a phenomenal military duty or police sidearm. Uh, but they opted, of course, for the CZ-82 at the, for the time being until, of course, commercial use began in, in the Czech Republic. So what we have here, of course, as I mentioned, is a full steel frame with a slide that's encompassed into the frame, giving you that low bore axis, which has been co uh, copied by a lot of other companies. The SP-01 in particular had an extended magazine capacity at 18 rounds plus a accessory rail. Standard model CZ-75 did not have any of that. The ergonomics balance and weight of this is excellent. If you ever get a chance to handle one or to shoot one, the, the recoil impulse is excellent. There's just a huge cult following on these CZ-75 handguns. They're just an excellent firearm. Now the standard model 75 or the Omega, uh, whichever one you wanna go with, or the, just the base model is typically gonna retail about 580 respectively. Now they do make a compact version of this as well. And of course that's under normal circumstances. The SP-01 like this, which is considered technically a competition model, um, the sort of getting you into the competition, the shadow twos and all of that's going to get you a little bit higher into that realm. But uh, those are going to add a little bit of value somewhere around the 650 to $680 price point. Of course, now prices are elevated, but that's typically what you're going to find. An SPO one used, you might find around the five to $600 price point. A standard 75 used, uh, you could probably find between about four and $500 under normal circumstances. A lot of police departments have used the base model 75 around the world for many years. You can typically find surplus 75s uh, for maybe uh, three to 350. And of course they're gonna have worn finish and everything, but they're gonna function just fine like a CZ-75 should. So I am a huge fan of the 75 series of handguns. They are excellent pistols. Definitely recommend taking a look if you see one. All right, up next I have a pretty cool one. This is a ZPAP 92, Zestava, uh, Yugoslavia or Serbia, I should say. So these are actually made in Serbia and then imported through a Zestava USA, which is a USA based importation outlet for Zestava small arms or Zestava firearms. Now, as many of you guys remember, a lot of these Zestava, Zestava excuse me, products, the MPAPs, the OPAPs, the M70s, they came in through Century Arms. Those were also made by Zestava in Serbia and then imported that way. So they just have their own importation outlet is really all that's changed. It's also given them a little bit of leeway on the different product offerings and, and a little bit control over their pricing as well. So one interesting thing we have here is the Model 92 or the ZPAP P92 pistol, which is really in a cream cough configuration. It comes just like this. Now the typical models that you see do not have a top rail section here or a back rail section here. Uh, apparently this was a special configuration or a special order, or I don't know if the former owner just tacked these things on here. Um, the cool thing about this is of course, if you wanna run an optic or anything like that, you have that available. The best thing about the rear trunnion mounted, and it actually looks like it was manufactured this way because it was recessed. There's some machining, as you can see, it's kind of the rear trunnion was recessed to allow uh, this rear section of rail. The cool thing about that is it allows you to put on things like this tail hook brace. Now they don't sell this package complete with the tail hook. I've seen people using like the SIG brace, uh, like the AR-15 style braces, but this actually to me is really cool. It's not like, you know, the, the typical crank offs, you would either have an underfolder or a, uh, a triangle style side folding brace, but this one actually, let's see if I can get this right. There is a, oh, it just lifts. It lifts and folds, folds over, making this a really cool package. Also, the muzzle device that this typically comes with is the Krinkov style sort of a conical shaped uh, muzzle device, actually known for throwing very big fireballs out the end. Now this is a really nice, uh, muzzle device that was included. It's uh, AKB USA is the manufacturer, but 
the previous owner had. And actually this does a really good job of hiding all that muzzle blast. If you have a crank off and you wanna hide all of that, this is a really good device to use for that. There's a lot of information. I know, I know like Rob Ski, AK Operators Union, did some muzzle device testing with AKs and found that this is one of the best hiding muzzle flash. So really cool product there as well. Now, brand new, the MSRP on their base model without the two sections of rail on them is about $900. Right now, that's about what people are selling them for, actually a little bit higher new. Uh, I've seen them upwards of about, I don't know, $900 to $1,000 new. So right there at MSRP or just a little bit over. With the rail sections on it, I don't know how much higher. I actually looked at Zestava's website and I could not find this as a product offering. Uh, they had it in both the wood and the polymer furniture set. This tail hook brace by itself, brand new, is about, I believe, leave $300 so you know you factor that into the price and this device here I believe is about 60 or $70 um, so anyway take that for what you will now when it comes to the crank off itself it is basically a PDW sort of sub gun although it is a 760 by 39 sort of personal defense weapon rooted in the AK style platform a lot of people said that it was you know spat snaz that came up with the crank off model I think it was really crank off I think came out of like a 1970s US magazine, the whole term crank off. It's a little bit of a, I'm sure that they existed and were used in military application, but it's not as like special or secretive of a weapon or, or what I want to say, I was sort of a elite operator type weapons platform. I think it was likely used as like an ancillary for vehicle drivers, paratroopers, stuff like that. Anybody who needed a compact package. Now, I'm not a expert on uh, crank off style AKs, but that's just sort of what I've uh, gleaned from my limited research on this design. TFB TV did a really good video on the crank off style as a whole, so you might want to go check that out. But anyway, uh, with the tail hook on it in this package used, uh, probably $1,100 is about what they're retailing at right now. Really, really cool package. If you're looking for something that's not an SBR, again, remember this is a pistol brace and this is a handgun. With that little extra length on the rear trunnion actually gives it a really nice feel and just a good inexpensive way to get into the sort of crank off type feel, small compact AK without having to worry about a uh, $200 tax stamp SBR sort of thing. So just a really nice package. All right, up next I have a firearm from Kimber. This is a Ultra Carry 2 officer size 1911 45 ACP bitone. They do make this in an all stainless and an all black. The wood grips are standard. New retail pricing on this is about, well, typically under normal circumstances, about $850. Right now it's up to about $950 to $1,000 used. You're typically finding them between $7 and $8 at the current market if you look on places like Gunbroker. Normally you should be able to find this used between about $600 and $700 respectively, you know, in the original box in good condition. So Kimber, as a company, was founded in 1979. They actually got their start on 22 rifles. That's where they really got their acclaim and their name. It is a company that's been through different interesting tumultuous times. In the 80s, they had uh, problems with financing. And then again, in the early 2000s, they had an officer there who was arrested and actually sent to prison for embezzling money from the company. So kind of a rocky uh, history. Now, one of the things that they are undoubtedly known for is their 1911s. Like many companies, Smith & Wesson Colt, back in the 70s and 80s, you did have a lot of hand craftsmanship. Final finishing, polishing, and finishing on firearms like 1911s, revolvers from Colt and Smith, you know, and such, uh, coming out in really, really good, uh, you know, put together by masters of their trade in, you know, the firearms manufacturing field. Kimber definitely got their name as having hand fitted custom high quality 1911s that were typically for what they were very reasonably priced in the uh, between $1,000 and $1,500 price point. Now a lot of their products are still in that price point but they do now have sub thousand dollar handguns like this which are really nice. But nowadays the Kimber firearms are mainly assembly line guns like you're going to find with Colt and Smith & Wesson and Ruger and uh, you know whoever else that's putting out 1911s or, or any firearms in today's manufacturing uh, landscape. With the current cost of labor and, and things like that it's really uneconomical to uh, have things put together by master gunsmiths and stuff. We went over that and like the Python explanation was a good example is you know the Python pistol from the 50s to the new Python today the difference in the manufacturing techniques. For what it is though and for the price you know in the 850 range you are competing you're a little bit higher than the SR series from 1911 
You're in like the Range Officer uh, series from Springfield. You're in the, the Colt 1911 baseline handguns. In that market, this definitely competes well. They are very nicely made. They are great to look at. The tolerances in them are tight, even though this is used. This is a very, very tight handgun. Probably wasn't used that much. They do definitely look elegant. There is a stylizing and final finishing to Kemper 1911s that you really don't see on a lot of other products, unless you're getting into something like an E-Series Smith & Wesson. Um, the trigger on them, you guys know I like the Desert Eagle 1911s. The trigger on this is not as nice as that, in my opinion. I definitely like, if I was going to go with one, I would go with an officer size Desert Eagle. And those, again, about this price, $850. Um, and I think that that would be a good competitor to this or a good comparison point. But still, a really nice handgun. I get lots of people in looking for Kempers, and you know, it's, it's easy to see why. They just look good, they function great, uh, they're nice, reliable handguns, and uh, definitely just have that sort of, um, that sort of, uh, Kempers just always have that sort of elitism about the name. So if you guys own Kempers or like Kempers, you know what I'm talking about, always good to see one come in. All right, up next I have a Turkish Mauser, more specifically, this is an M38. Now there were two uh, main variations that you're going to find on the market. The 1938 like this and the 1903. The 1903 obviously being the earlier one. The main differences between the two is a change in design in the rear receiver bridge and also a modification to the bolt. Okay, that came out on the 1938. So the bolts actually are not interchangeable between the two. Now after you have the development of the Mauser action by Peter Paul and Wilhelm Mauser. Pre-World War I, of course, you have the Gewehr 88 that would come out in Germany. A lot of other countries would take note of this action, and even still today it is regarded as the strongest or probably the one of the strongest actions that has ever uh, been conceived on any bolt action rifle. You have countries like Turkey, you have the Swedish Mausers, you have the Turkish Mausers, Mexican Mausers, um, you have uh, Spain with the FR8, uh, trying to think what other countries went off of the Mauser action. Yugoslavia was a big one. Implemented this design into their arms manufacturing. Even the 1903 Springfield is heavily influenced by the Mauser action. In fact, Germany sued the United States for the use of their action in the design. The United States had to pay a royalty to Germany for every unit it made while they were fighting in World War I, which is interesting. Due to the robustness, rigidity of the action, and ease of loading, which was a big one we saw in the Spanish-American War, you load with five rounds triple clips to the top of the action. Um, it was prolific, it was common to see a, a Mauser action designs. Now, as US collectors today, it's cool to find stuff like this because you can get the typical Germanic uh, Mauser action in slightly different packages like this, especially like the M48 and M27 Yugoslavian Mausers. You can find stuff like that and like this for about the three to $400 price point. Uh, of course, eight millimeter Mauser is widely available. You can still find it as surplus and new manufacturer from places like PPU. Now under normal circumstances, you're about 60 cents to a dollar around depending on where you find it. Uh, and again, these Mauser, uh, you know, Turkish and Yugoslavian Mausers are probably the cheapest of the Mauser variety that exists today. And again, you find them between, you know, something like this and this condition, probably $350, okay? They are raising steadily in price, but they're not going insane like other things. Like the Yugo and Turkish Mausers have always been sort of the bottom of the barrel in terms of uh, military surplus from around the world compared to things like K31s and even Mosin and Nagants are getting up into the pricing of stuff like this. So for, again, slightly more or at the price of a Mosin, you can get a nice robust Mauser action in a package like this uh, and have a lot of fun plinking. Now there is not really a lot of military collectible or a lot of military collecting in Yugoslavian and Turkish uh, firearms, which is probably why the price point on them has stayed lower than the price point of Mausers from other countries. But still, if you're just looking for that shooter, something really cool, different, unique, um, you know, I don't see a lot of these come in. This is probably like maybe my second Turkish Mausers in the six, year that, six years that we've been here. Now, the Yugo Mausers, I've had maybe 10 to 15 of those, but uh, just something different and cool. Really happy to see this type of stuff come in. You guys know I love surplus. And this is just a really nice, unique one, and really one you guys should consider looking at if you are into surplus collecting. Now that gives me a segue into this one. Our last but not least for this video, a German K98K from World War II. Now more specifically, this is a Russian capture. About three or four weeks ago on one of these videos, I had a different Russian capture. So I'm not gonna get too much into the nitty gritty on what that is. You can refer to that video, but the gist of it is, 
that, of course, at the end of the, the, the World War II, the fall of Berlin, you have two major countries squeezing Berlin from the east and the west, that's Russia and the United States. The United States, typically, you would have, when they surrendered rifles, they would pull the bolt out of the action like this and throw the bolts in one pile and the rest of the gun in a different pile. The Russians, what they would do is they would take the guns and they would disassemble every single part. They'd take the bolt, the bolt head off, the safety, they would drop the action out of the stock, pull the barrel bands off, of course, and then, and then when they you know, were back in Russian warehouses, they would throw them all in different part spins. They would typically get dipped in this very blackish type finish, stamped with a cross rifle, which a lot of people call the X Russian capture marking on it, which this one has somewhere, I saw it. And of course, you know, they would be there as ancillary backup rifles in case Russia ended up in another war. Of course, we ended up in the Cold War after World War II, and they would sit there ready to go in case the war turned hot and Russia needed them for defense or assault purposes, if you will. You know, well after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the bringing down of the Berlin Wall, and of course we go past all that, Russia decides they don't need all these K-98 sitting in their warehouses, so they get with American importers, they put them back together, they electric pencil all the small parts on and bring them into the United States as surplus. Most commonly we saw these coming in in about the 90s and the early 2000s. Now when they came in, they were about at the two to $300 price point. Now they've gone way up. These guys in this condition, it's actually a really nice Russian capture, uh, you know, typically seven, $800 is where they are, which was about what you used to be able to get a matching one for. Now those are up to like two, three thousand dollars. So the pricing on original German Mausers has gone insane, which is also a good reason if you don't want to pay those prices to look at a Yugo or a Turkish Mauser like the one you just saw. Um, there is still, you know, the, the fact that this was Russian captured still gives uh, you know, uh, credence to its military history. It saw service, you know, use in, by Germany in World War II. It was captured by the Russians. It spent time in Russian warehouses and then came into the, to the United States like this as surplus. So actually it's how it looks is part of its, uh, its history and life, its military history, which is still, um, you know, the package is still a, you know, a historic relic from the past and definitely has a timeline associated with it. So very cool. Also, they make great shooters. If you are going to get into one, you want an actual original K98, you don't want to drop the two to 3,000 on an original all matching gun that you might risk cracking the stock on. Still six to $800 is a lot for something like this, but a lot better than dropping that much money again if you want to go out and shoot it. So this one is coded DUV, which is, um, Berlin Lubecker. There was a BYF was Mauser, AC uh, was Walther, CYQ was Spreework, DOT was Brno in Czechoslovakia, CE was uh, Sauer and Sons, and I'm going off of memory here. <laughs> um, trying to think what else. I uh, see uh, there was uh, Guslaferka, which was the um, Buchenwald concentration camp. That was uh, code BCD. You saw those on those G43s. Uh, anyway, I digress. The reason they use date codes is because uh, when you know these would get captured and picked up, they didn't want big Mauser banners or Walther or Guslav Verka, uh, where the U.S. would say, "Oh, this is where you know right here, this is where the arms are being manufactured. Let's target and bomb those plants." So, using the code, it was a way to keep a secrecy of who was making arms for Germany, especially when they would come in, uh, you know, in the, in the late 1930s when they were violating the treaties for making military arms, which they were not supposed to do due to the Versailles Treaty after World War One. So, um, very, very cool. Amount of history on these of course non-parts matching if you see a russian capture again a great way to get into a original german mauser authentic world war ii complete with uh you know date codes with manufacturing production it was made in 1942 by duv uh code the um berlin lubecker plant in berlin in 1942 uh, of course you have the waffen amps all over it so really really cool history definitely worth taking a look if you see one well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel as we do post them every single week. If you guys have any questions, please leave those down below. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.